Great. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item on our agenda is uh, the approval of the minutes from uh, the board's July 27th, 2017 meeting. Uh, I move the um, approval of the minutes. Is there a second? Second, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, the next item uh, on our agenda is the statement of the chair. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the August 3, 2017 public meeting of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. In just a moment, the board will approve its first public funds payments of the 2017 election cycle. This marks the 10th consecutive citywide election in which the CFB has administered payments. Today, the board is preparing to vote on payments totaling nearly $7 million to candidates participating in the primary elections on September 11 in citywide and borough-wide races, as well as in uh, uh, 25, I think. In 25 city council districts in all five boroughs. Uh, the public funds are paid to participating candidates who qualify for contributions raised from New York City residents at a rate of $6 in public funds for each of the first $175 contributed. So each contribution from a city resident could be worth up to $1,050 in public funds to that candidate. Public matching funds are an important investment in the political process that have uh, defined city elections for nearly 30 years. The public funds encourage candidates to raise small dollar contributions in their neighborhoods. This limits the influence of large contributions from special interests and ensures that candidates better understand and address the diverse interests and needs of everyday New Yorkers. At this time, I will turn to our executive director, Amy Loprest, for her report. Okay, let me first correct my mistake and statement to the chair. It's 23 council districts I miscounted. Um, uh, so the, the first payment date is a big milestone for the campaign finance board in every election cycle. And as with all of our work, it takes a team to make this happen, from developing the systems for candidates to submit disclosure statements, to processing those statements, to answering questions from campaigns. But today I would like to single out the hard work of the audit unit under the direction of Roberto Baldini, Assistant Executive Director for Campaign Finance Administration, Sada Chapman, the Director of Auditing and Accounting, Danielle Willibin, who is the Deputy Director of Auditing and Accounting, and the entire, the entire our audit staff has been hard at work reviewing the disclosure statements and the documentations of campaigns and working with the campaigns to arrive at these payments. Um, I want to especially recognize the work of our payment coordinator, Shazia Kamami, and our assistant payment coordinator, Garrett Laruchu. Uh, and uh, thank them for their incredibly long hours and diligent work in making us get to this day. I'm going to actually clap. <laughs> um, at this time, uh, I'll ask for a motion to go into executive session. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. We will now go into an executive session.
<clears throat> the staff is recommending to the board that it dismiss a complaint filed against the campaign of Thomas Lopez Pierre. The CFB staff has investigated allegations contained in the complaint. That investigation determined that there is an insufficient basis to find a violation against the campaign. But before considering a motion to that effect, I would like to read a brief statement on behalf of the board. This board is aware of certain objectionable public statements made by Thomas Lopez Pierre. We are also aware that some have urged us to withhold his public funds payment based on those statements. However, the Campaign Finance Act treats all candidates the same without regard to the content of their speech. To qualify for public funds, candidates must of measurable contributions from New York City residents. As always, today's public funds payment determinations are based on these objective criteria and nothing else. A core aim of the city's campaign finance program is to make it possible for more New Yorkers to get involved in the political process. While there are times when public matching funds go to candidates whose messages some find objectionable, the program undoubtedly makes it easier for more good people to run for office. So as I said, there's a recommendation uh, from the staff to dismiss the complaint against Thomas Lopez Pierre. I'll uh, make a motion to that effect. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abs abstentions? The motion carries. The next item uh, on our agenda is a vote with regard to the public funds payments. Um, and in order to formulate that motion, I will ask our executive director uh, to state what the funds payments will consist of. Okay. Um, the staff is recommending that the board approve the following public funds payments. For the Office of Mayor, a payment to Bill de Blasio in the amount of $2,579,427 for total payments for that office of that amount. For the Office of Borough President, to Ruben Diaz Jr., a candidate for Bronx Borough President in the amount of $204,950, which is the total amount for that office. In City Council District 1, a payment to Margaret Chin in the amount of $95,095. And to Dashia Imperiale, $23,774. Chris for Marta Marte, $95,095. In Council District 2, a payment to Carlina Rivera in the amount of $95,095. To, and to Mary Silver in the amount of $95,095. In Council District 4, a payment to Rachel Honig in the amount of $93,309. Jeffrey Mailman in the amount of $90,493. Keith Powers, $95,095. Bessie Schachter, $83,864. Martha Speranza, $95,095. In Council District 6, to Carrie Goodman, $31,903. To Helen Rosenthal, $95,095. In Council District 7, to Thomas Lopez Pierre, $88,236. In District 8, Diana Ayala, $95,095. In District 9, to Cordell Clear, $44,614. In and Bill Perkins, $46,056. In Council District 13, to John Doyle, $95,095. And Marjorie Velasquez, $94,857. 
in Council District 14 to Randy Abreu, $72,595. And, count, and Felix Perdomo, $44,944. In Council District 17, Helen Hines, $32,233. In Council District 18, Michael Beltzer, $67,653. Elvin Garcia, $95,095. In Council District 19, Paul Graziano, $91,770. And Paul Vallone, $95,095. In Council District 20, Allison Tan, $95,095. In Council District 24, Mohammed Rahman, $63,065. In Council District 28, Richard David, $95,095. ,095. Hetty Powell, $95,095. In Council District 30, Robert Holden, $95,095. In Council District 32, Michael Scala, $35,916. In Council District 34, Antonio Reynosa, $93,080. Tommy Torres, $63,173. In Council District 35, Lori Cumbo, $95,095. Edie Fox, $95,047. In Council District 38, Carlos Manchaca, $92,221. And Felix Ortiz, $95,047. In Council District 41, Alika Ampre Samuel, $73,399. And Henry Butler, $95,095. In Council District 42, Inez Barron, $45,087. In Council District 43, Justin Brannon, $94,382. Kevin Peter Carroll, $95,095. Kader El Yatim, $95,095. Liam McCabe, $95,095. John Quaglione, $95,095. Nancy Tong, $95,095. In Council District 48, Chaim Deutsch, $23,061. In Council District 49, Camilla Payne Hanks, $95,095. Deborah Rose, $95,095. For total payments for the Office of City Council of $3,962,059 and total payments of $6,746,436. Thank you. I move that the board uh, approve the recommendations of the staff with regard to these public funds payments. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? The motion carries. With respect to that last motion, um, I, I wish to make the following statement on behalf of the board. There has been some recent public comment about the mayor's certification of need for the full public funds match. The board has determined that the evidence submitted in the certification satisfies the law's requirement that the mayor is opposed by candidates who have received significant media exposure in the 12 months preceding the election. Significant media exposure is defined by the law as the, quote, appearance of the opponent or his or her name on television or radio in the area of the covered election or in print media in general circulation in the area of the covered election at least 12 times in the year preceding the covered election, end quote. After the elections, and as required by law, the board will consider whether to propose to the City Council amendments to the law with respect to this provision, particularly regarding borough-wide and citywide races. The next item on our agenda is a vote to lift certain expenditure limits. Uh, Amy, would you please uh, present the uh, details okay. uh, for the motion. The law provides that in 
in uh, races where an opponent is a non-participant and has uh, raised or spent in the aggregate amount uh, an amount that exceeds half the ex applicable expenditure limit, that the expenditure limit for all participating candidates in that race is increased to 150 percent of the limit. The staff makes the recommendation that the board find that this has happened in nine city council races in Council District 2, Council District 7, Council District 12, Council District 13, Council District 17, 18, 20, 24, and 30. I move that the board uh, adopt those recommendations. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, the appearance of uh, representatives of, of candidate William C. Thompson, Jr. Uh, I have <coughs> recused myself from consideration of this matter, and Mr. Davis will uh, chair the remainder of this meeting. I want to point out for the record that at the last meeting, um, uh, Steph Turney, Bethany Persky um, appeared before the board and answered some of the board's questions. Ms. Persky is uh, uh, otherwise occupied on a different uh, uh, matter uh, at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. So, oh, but there she is. <laughs> it's like so dramatic. <laughs> 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 okay, well, ignore my previous statement. <laughs> All right, so why don't uh, everybody identify themselves first uh, for, for the board? Uh, Bethany Persky. Danielle Willeman. And for Mr. Thompson? James Ross, uh, treasurer. Now, at the, uh, at the last uh, meeting, which I guess was only last week, <laughs> um, we agreed to defer this matter for one week and one week only. Um, some additional materials had been submitted the night before that meeting, uh, which we did not determine at that time whether we would or would not consider. Um, and my understanding is that some additional materials was submitted to the board staff this morning, hundreds of pages of materials. Um, and, um, you know, when we, I'll have a question about that when we get to your turn. Um, let's see, what, is anything, we, I, we do not have to repeat everything we did before, but is there anything you'd like to say at the outset? Uh, just to note that, as you say, the, those documents were only submitted this morning, and obviously this is a very busy time for us and our audit staff, and we really have not been had sufficient time to review that documentation or what its implications would be for the staff recommendations. So before you begin any other presentation, the first question that I'd like you to address is what was the reason why the material submitted last week and this morning could not have been submitted any time in the last two and a half years? Um, difficult or question <laughs> to answer, uh, only to state that <clears throat> the material is extremely voluminous. A lot of it was difficult to put together uh, in order to meet uh, some of the um, findings that were made by the board, we had to, uh, in some instances, engage in what I would term detective work, going over bank statements, piecing together emails. Um, I want to add something that I think is very important here. Uh, the documents that were submitted last week and also today um, in my opinion, are directly responsive to findings made uh, previously in the audits done by this board. To, to not consider this material, I think, would actually be to deny the spirit of the act that uh, we all seek to further. Uh, we demonstrate in the submission today, and I'm familiar with all parts of it, that many of the uh, violations which were set forth previously 
did not in fact occur, that there was compliance, just insufficient documentation having been submitted, which has now been supplemented. So um, I am requesting that this material be considered. I think it's really important, and I think it's substantive. We're not wasting anybody's time with this material. Am, am I right, though, but on, on March 3rd, 2016, is when the campaign was notified of the potential violations for the first time, and obviously there was, you know, subsequent materials provided, and, you know, am, am, is that correct? And what, do you have any further information about the chronology? Uh, other than what Executive Director Lopez read into the record last week, but that, that's the data I have for the penalty notice being sent out. Uh, most of the content of the penalty notice was also contained in the draft audit report, which was a year earlier, March 9th, 2015. Okay. What else, is there any particular uh, uh, other substantive point that you would like to make? No, just that I think uh, really in order to carry out the spirit of the law that this material should be considered. I mean, that uh, to bar it uh, as a result of of time would result in an unjust result. Is there one particular item, focusing in particular on ones of large dollar magnitude, is there one in particular you'd like to highlight or point out? There are several. I Just one. I'd like to know one. Is there one large one that you'd point to as among the most significant? Um, If I may, yes, there was um, violation for um, failing to report uh, transactions where we provide evidence that, in fact, the um, there had been documentation submitted. Um, over the limit contributions, we attach proof of refunds of the over the limit amounts. Uh, the total amount of that violation was $34,666. Um, accepting contributions from corporations, LLCs, or partnerships, total amount of that val violation was over 38000 We have documentary evidence that, in fact, a significant portion of that, uh, those contributions did not come from corporations, LLCs, or partnerships. Um, failing to document transactions, we have documentary evidence that shows that those are documented. And uh, significantly, the failure to comply with intermediary requirements. Uh, we have a situation where the campaign has disclosed intermediaries uh, based on the pattern of contributions received from them, but have a situation where certain intermediaries have failed or refused to sign intermediary forms despite our very diligent efforts to get them to do so. So, uh, you know, I, I do feel this is significant and um, should be considered. I appreciate that. I mean, I think you also have to understand that Given the number of extensions, the number of uh, the time that the the, the campaign was um, was allotted to provide information, it becomes very difficult to administer a program where you have audits, and then you have penalty notices, and then when the process is supposedly over, uh, materials keep coming in, and the rules really do allow us not to consider it. Now, we will, when we deliberate, make a judgment about what we will not, what will and will not consider. But um, there are important uh, policy reasons why it becomes dangerous to keep accepting materials day after day after day, even after last week when we thought we were done to get stuff this morning. So we will consider what we will, con we will determine what we will consider when we deliberate. Um, I have a s substantive question. I'm just a little, in terms of the materials that were considered, were de delivered last week, and um, again, without 
ruling as to what, what we are or aren't going to consider. I'm a little confused in terms of the uh, in, important in-kind contributions from uh, Minor Artico, Willis Group, and Bedford Grove. Was what, what, Did C-Smart show that there were actual payments made to those groups? I mean, what... I believe C-SMART reflected the expenditures, but not the payments associated with those expenditures. Is that that correct? So it looks like the campaign reported an expenditure, whether they reported it, but they didn't submit the amendment to us. So they entered in the information into the program, but then didn't submit the amendment to us. So we don't, we never saw that until they printed out the screenshots. So whether those payments were actually made, we don't know. So we what have, would be in C-SMART? In other words, would, 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 what is in C-SMART, putting aside whether it was reported separately to us, what exactly would be in C-SMART? To, that either would, if it was not submitted to us, then nothing's in C-SMART. What the campaign submitted, I believe, is a screenshot of their own C-SMART software, their screen as they entered it in. But for whatever reason, that information was not transmitted to us. And so it wasn't reported. It wasn't disclosed. Would there be any documentation that we're aware of which would support what was in in their screenshot? I don't know about – even setting aside the reporting issue, if we had proof of the payment, this would not be a problem. Yeah, that, that's what I'm getting to. If so we had it, copies of the checks and bank statements – We don't have any of that. You we do. Didn't. You do. It's in – it's in the submission that you have today. It's in the submission, today's submission. Yes, it, it is. Willis Group, Minortico, uh, the very things, Bedford Grove, that you just inquired about. It, it, it is a little frustrating that there's, I can't conceive of a reason that that and bank statements that I understand were submitted today that are bank statements from the last period of number of years. But we will consider that uh, what we will consider when we go back into deliberations. And I, and so just to be clear, on uh, in the in the last week's submission, there they there was some attempt to <laughs> a point to documentation if from the bank statements. So like saying here, there's a check. They, so there was some, you know, for these payments to point to items in the bank statements, but we didn't there without a check to know that that was actually the person to whom that payment was made. It's impossible to see. What now, I understand is that you are now saying that you actually have the actual checks, checks. not and that you're not just pointing again to the bank statements. Right. The bank statements, unfortunately, did not come with copies of fronts and backs of checks as okay. they do on all of our bank statements. Yeah. So uh, we had to dig up the canceled checks, uh, which we've done. Uh, I, you know, I understand exactly what you said, Mr. Davis. I hear you. <laughs> I hear all of you that uh, there are reasons for limits. We're talking about <coughs> a week. And we're talking no, about... No, 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 no. no, I, no, no. I, know. I, I have to interrupt. We're not talking about... I know, we're I know. Not, we're, talk, we're talking about draft audit reports from two years ago. Okay. And but, we're talking about penalty notices from over a year ago. We're not, we're not talking about okay. a week. That's fair enough. <laughs> but uh, what I will say is that what we have here is backup for what was submitted last week and backup for, for what was already disclosed, but... The proof submitted was not sufficient. Okay. I, I just want to note, first of all, that we're not even just talking about the amount of time, but also the number of extensions already granted by CFP staff. Every time the campaign came back and said, we need more time, we said yes, as indicated in that timeline that was read into the record. I also want to note that in terms of finding emails and retrieving documentation, what Mr. Ross is describing is routine compliance activity that is required of all campaigns at the most basic level. This was a seasoned candidate with substantial experience with the program. There was no reason not to be aware of these requirements, not to be able to provide this documentation, some of which was from 2012 and 2013 in a timely manner. And can I, and also many of these findings that we're talking about were actually in the draft audit report, most of yes, them. Almost all oh. of them because the the DAR response, was, was there no DAR response or there was... It, it the DAR was response was very was, minimal. Yes, and so most of those findings from the DAR were not resolved, and so they reappeared in the penalty notice as well. 
Okay, so we'll con we'll make a judgment about what we'll consider when we deliberate on the penalties and where, where we are. Any questions for anybody else? Do you have any questions? Do you have anything else anybody else wants to say? Um, without everything's trying the allowed, but nothing's the required. Board, <laughs> without the trying the patience of the board. I Thank you I'll very stop. much. We Thank appreciate you. your coming. All right, we're going to adjourn now for uh, deliberations. Whether we need a motion, or not, I don't know. <laughs>
session, having deliberated, and we're now going to, I'm going to read a uh, uh, penalties for the William uh, Thompson Jr. campaign, uh, and then ask for a vote. One, failing to provide bank statements, $500. Failing to report transactions, $3,716. Filing a late disclosure statement, violation, no penalty. Failing to demonstrate compliance with subcontractor reporting and documentation requirements, $100. Failing to disclose political committees, violation, no penalty. Accepting over the limit contributions, 27,338. Accepting contributions from corporations, limited liability companies, or partnerships, $24,803. Failing to document transactions, $6,613. Failing to demonstrate compliance with intermediate reporting and documentation requirements, $2,900. Failing to demonstrate that spending was in furtherance of the campaign, $2,149 making impermissible post-election expenditures, $544, exceeding the expenditure limit, $16,692, commingling campaign funds with funds accepted for a different election, violation, no penalty, for total penalties of $85,355. Do I have a motion to approve these penalties? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 I do have a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Okay, can you just hold it?